important. Okay, mRNA based vaccines. So what this does, let's draw the SARS virus here again. No, well, SARS CoV 2. SARS has RNA in it. Okay, don't think of that RNA when I'm saying these RNA based vaccine. Um, but when this virus replicates itself, this RNA enters the cell and this RNA carries messenger RNA sequences, gene sequences uh, for these. This, these are the um, spike proteins. Um, so spike proteins or S proteins is what they're called, abbreviating. There are some other proteins on this virus as well. There's some, uh, it's got to build this protein capsid envelope. Uh, there are some other parts to it too, but the big one is this. And then when your body mounts an immune response, when this comes in, the goal is, Mr. Swiss, thank you. Uh, welcome. The goal is to mount a response where something can identify these receptors on the virus and your body can then destroy this without ever knowing it. So how a vaccine, normal vaccine works, they give you a form of the virus. Usually it's a dead form of the virus. It depends on the virus of what the form of the vaccine is, but you give it to someone and this enters a person's system. So let's say the, the normal route here. So this, this enters a person your, your body then mounts an immune response against these cells, kind of like we just talked about when talking about the respiratory system there, when the dendritic cell comes in, eats the virus, chops it up, presents fragments on it, takes those fragments to the lymph nodes, presents them to B cells and T cells. B cells then produce antibodies against those pieces, where those pieces here are these uh, spike proteins. And then, but this takes time, this is slow. And then eventually your antibodies are then produced by these B cells. They become what are called plasma cells. And then from some of those B cells become what are called memory B cells, which store the information for the spike protein. So here, a normal vaccine produces, makes the B cells, but it takes time to develop that vaccine. It takes a while. So it forms a memory B and T cells. And then, so that's primary exposure. Then when you get a secondary exposure, so virus comes in again, this is my horrible virus down here. Virus comes in again, secondary exposure. You never even knew it happened because these memory cells detect those spike proteins right away. Mass just fire out interleukins, the red bull to your immune system, mass produce antibodies. You never even knew it happened. And then they all, all these antibodies. So an antibody looks something like this. And then up here, there's different shapes to them, but this is typically it. And up here is the uh, antigen receptor region. This antigen receptor region binds to the spike protein, which is the antigen. So these little antibodies surround these viruses and then macrophages come in and eat them. Typically is roughly how it goes. The hardest part of the vaccine is designing this vector. How do we get that into the cell and so forth? So this spike protein is coded somewhere in this messenger RNA. The idea is that what if we force our cells to express this protein, then our body can mount immune response. No virus is injected. So we know the sequence of the spike protein. So the S protein has its sequence of RNA. So these S proteins are made from this RNA. You, you put this messenger RNA into a cell, cell as the ribosomes, you can initiate transcription. You then will produce a cell that has that spike protein on it. So this is that dendritic cell or that antigen presenting cell we talked about earlier. So this is a dendritic cell would in theory ingest this messenger RNA. So how this messenger RNA gets in the cell, I'm not exactly sure that process, but then this cell presents it. And then this is just like any antigen presenting cell. It's just this antigen presenting cell was given the information to present. Whereas over here, this cell was eaten by the antigen presenting cell and then chopped it up and then processed, presented the fragments randomly. In this one, this is almost like an autoimmune disease in a way where your body's own cells are producing a protein that your body rejects, which is very fascinating when you think about it. When I first read about this, I thought they were putting in DNA because DNA is more stable. And I thought they were putting DNA into the sequence of these cells and then always presenting these spike proteins or mass producing these spike proteins. But that would change those cells forever. Putting in the messenger RNA, these cells would then produce these and then you could mount an immune response. You would go through the primary immune response here. 
primary immune response. And then if you get infected again, that would prime you then for the vaccine. But here you never had to come in uh, contact with the actual virus. The only thing you came in contact with was one protein sequence from that virus. But there are a bunch of questions in this methodology that I'm skeptical about. Um, so RNA, one, is single-stranded. Single-stranded RNA isn't stable. Uh, DNA is double-stranded. That makes DNA a lot more stable than RNA. You put all that into you know a syringe here. This is my beautiful syringe. This is my needle coming out. You know you have the little syringe pump here, and you fill the RNA in there, and then you inject it into someone. How does it maintain its structure? How can they mass produce this RNA? How can they ship it around the world? So then they in would inject it into someone. It would form this primary response. It'd be just like a vaccine then. It'd be just like a vaccine and forming that primary response to form the memory. And then if you get infected with the virus, you don't even realize it. Step one, skep well, skepticism one from me is how do they maintain integrity of this RNA? And then they have to inject it and then it has to go through your blood. It, so there's a whole bunch of barriers in just after the injection. They, they, they're saying a uh, subcutaneous injection to your hypodermis should do the trick. Uh, so that's right into your skin, like just a random injection to your arm. Because uh, in there you have, you have these dendritic cells which will uptake that RNA and hopefully that RNA structure is still there. And then those will become antigen presenting cells and you mount the primary immune response. But the question is, when that RNA is taken in, does it keep its structure when it goes in? Can it form the spike protein after it enters? And can it form enough to form that primary response? There's a lot of questions to this. Yeah, potential side effects. So what are the long-term effects? How long is that initial, how long is that protein made for? If you're producing antibodies and things like that, you're so those dendritic cells, another thing they produce are is interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 goes up to your hypothalamus in your brain and turns up your temperature regulation, which gives you a fever. So you have an immune response. And if you activate those interleukins, you get that immune response. So what sort of immune response will be caused by these messenger RNAs? How much does a cell not like having random nucleic acid floating around? Yeah, I mean, it's just to a cell, it's just messenger RNA. There's messenger RNA all over the cytoplasm and rough ER of the cell. The question is, does it, is it gonna affect anything? The RNA vaccines, including those based on messenger RNA, have the potential to overcome the limitations of plasma DNA and viral vectors. Uh, related to the cost and feasibility of many, so here's um, what I was wondering. Uh, related to the cost and feasibility of manufacturing RNA vaccines are being addressed, increasing the likelihood that RNA-based vaccines will be commercially viable. Proof of concept for the RNA vaccines has been demonstrated in humans, and a prospect for further development into commercial products are very encouraging. This paper was back in 2012, by the way. Ooh, what is this? Testing criteria. Huh. I never looked at these numbers. So Italy, 9,400 tests, of which 470 positive, or five point, a 5% 5 positivity rate. I never looked into positivity rates. Uh, so how many people tested versus how many actually come about? So that positivity rate could be based on the how efficient that RT-PCR testing is too. That's kind of high, this 5% here. And not there's an outbreak there right now. Uh, in the UK, 7,100 tests, 13 positive. Whereas United States, this is one thing that's worrisome about the United States. We've only tested 445 people. How many people have come from other countries that should probably be tested and here at 14 positive? So I feel like we need to, you know, reduce our testing criteria and test more. With all the tr overseas traveling that has happened, some people probably arrived here that were just in Italy and they just came through the airport and were never tested. Here, let's talk about it. Uh, initially declined to test a patient who on February 26 uh, become the latest confirmation case and the first with an unknown origin of infection, raising concern that there are more cases circulating among the general public that have not been identified. Oh, this is a big thing. Just 12 of more than 100 public health labs in the US are currently able to test for COVID-19 because of a problem with the test developed by the CDC. I did not know about this. 
The agency can now screen only 350 to 500 samples per day. As of February 26, CDC had performed a total of 445 tests for comparison in the UK with a population five times smaller. Oh, that's a big oof. You can't report a number that you never tested. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to jump up and say hi. You really want to say hi again? Over here. Really want to say hi again? That's getting really needy. Say hi. Say hi. <laughs> he just wanted to talk quick. You want to talk quick? Perfect. I hope you learned something tonight and you can share this knowledge with others. And if you ever have a question or anything, feel free to reach out to me on Discord or anything like that.